Uh, I think the one of the secrets to my success is my ability and willingness to just keep my word. And so when I make a commitment to someone, when I say I'm going to do something, I get it done. As far as the speed with which sometimes I get things done, uh, you know, that's that's something that that can vary. But you know, when I tell people that I'm going to do something, uh, I think being a person of your word is a really important thing to do. Today's special guest on the I Love Monday podcast is Kent Teague, who is a global, well-known businessman who travels the world and is also the principal investor of Leighton Orient Football Club. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Good to see you. So, Kent, I remember vividly about two or three years ago, we met in the partner conference room Mm -hmm. and I gave you my business card and you said, I will contact you. Mm -hmm. And... You contacted me the next day, mm-hmm. introduced me to Jody, who's your real estate partner, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, we've briefly kept in touch. Sure. Um, is that one of the secrets to your success? Uh, I think the one of the secrets to my success is my ability and willingness to just keep my word. And so when I make a commitment to someone, when I say I'm going to do something, I get it done. As far as the speed with which sometimes I get things done, uh, you know, that's that's something that, that can vary, but, you know, when I tell people that I'm going to do something, uh, I think being a person of your word is a really important thing to do. Why is that important in business? Well, in business, uh, business runs on trust. So if you trust someone and you trust that they are going to deliver or you trust that they're going to deliver the next time or if you trust that they're going to do what they say and be able to do what they say they're going to do, then you end up doing business and you also enjoy doing business with people like that. And I think even in personal relationships, you know, um, like my relationship with my wife and my relationships with my daughters and my family and friends and all of that, I do think it's just really important to just uh, keep your word. And if you're unable, and we're not always able to keep our commitments, that's impossible. Uh, all of us tend to overcommit. Nothing wrong with that. But the thing that we have to do then is just be willing to renegotiate the commitment and renegotiate the commitment in such a way that people, you know, don't lose too much trust in you. Oh, of course. Yeah. Um, tell us a bit of your childhood in Texas. Well, I grew up in a very middle-class family. Um, you know, I I remember going to my dad's graduation. Um, from uh, dental school, uh, and then my dad became a dentist. I was probably about eight or nine, nine years old, probably right in there. Uh, and then you know my dad became a dentist, and you know we we started to uh, you know become more integrated into the into the city that I lived in. So my dad became a little bit more well known, and so you know I had a very n- I don't know, traditional uh, family, you know, mom, dad at home. Most of the time my dad didn't travel. My mom was a homemaker. I have two sisters. They're both, uh, they are twins. They're 15 months younger than I am. They are incredible. My mom and dad are incredible. I have an incredible, uh, you know, original family. And my sisters are like 195% extrovert. They talk all the time, including in their sleep. Um, and you know, it was just, we just had, it, we, we lived in a suburb, so we just lived that sort of, uh, it wasn't a hard life, but it wasn't an easy life. Um, and you know, we just, it was just enjoyable. We were, we were really poor when I was young, really poor, but we didn't know we were poor. We didn't, we didn't know. You don't, you, we just didn't know. Um, and, but you know, that's just kind of how it was. When did you find out you were really poor? Found out we were really poor when probably we got to be about, uh, I probably remember that when I was probably about 13 or 14, and thinking back on where we lived, and I would go to the house where we lived in. It was a two-bedroom, one-bath house. It was very small. Um, And I remember driving back to that house and thinking, oh my gosh, look how small this house is compared to other houses, you know, in in and around where we lived in in Duncanville or in and around Dallas, you know, because you by then we're like we go to Highland Park, which is the wealthiest part of Dallas, and 
you go see these mansions and then you look at where you grew up and you're like, oh, I didn't realize it. You just didn't know. Yeah. So um, growing up, what were your aspirations? Oh, uh, when I was uh, probably up until I was probably 17 or 18, I was just trying to stay out of trouble, <laughs> you know, and uh, did you, you ever get into trouble? Oh, I got I got in a lot of trouble. Yeah, I got in a lot of trouble. And, um, you know, and I just I, I just remember uh, I was really fortunate. My aunt worked with a guy and that guy had a really big impact on my life. The guy's name is Zig Ziglar. And I remember reading Zig's books and listening to Zig's tapes. And then he told me something that's really been important in my life, and that is write it down. Like if you want something, write it down. Know what your goals are, write them down. And then read your goals every day. And then commit to do something on each of those goals every day. And that completely transformed my life. Um, when I was mid-20s, I was probably about 23, 24, 25, somewhere in there. Uh, I wrote down, I want to own a pro sports franchise. Now in America, that's what we call professional sports, it's pro sports franchises. But I wrote that down, um, you know, and fortunately uh, it came true because I read it a lot and I thought about it a lot and I wanted it a lot. Was that the first goal you, you wrote? No, down? no, no. The first goal that I wrote down is that I wanted to be a millionaire by the time I was 30. And I was pissed that I didn't get it done by the time I was 30. What age? It, uh, 34. Wow. Yeah, but anyway, but, but I, think the, I think the important part is, is that you write down what you want, you focus on what you want, you do what's necessary in order to create or to obtain or accomplish what you want, but you're laser focused because you know specifically what you're after and what you want to accomplish. I think it gives you a sense of clarity as well. It does, it does. And the other thing is, is that you can write down almost anything. You know, I want to be happy. And then you notice when you're happy and when you're not. Or you can write down very specific things like, I want this by this date. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's, it's one of the things that when I get the opportunity to talk uh, to people about how to accomplish things, it's one of the most important things that I learned. I, I actually, I'll just tell you, I'll tell you this. I actually just brain my, I brainwash myself into being successful. <laughs> that's, that's how I did it, you know. But I think if everyone does that, well, if everyone brainwashes themselves to be successful, wouldn't the world just be a better place? It would be incredible. And the thing is, is that each individual has so many different, a kaleidoscope of talents and, and abilities that each individual will write down different things, but all of those things will be based on something that they're going to contribute to the world. Because I believe that in order to obtain certain things in life, you have to contribute to life. It doesn't mean that if I you know, am really good to you, you're gonna be really good to me. Sometimes I'm good to you, and then it's somebody else over here in the chain that, that it all works out with. So I don't, necess I don't necessarily think that it's just, it's gonna work out perfectly one-on-one, -on -one, but I do believe that if people were more intentional about really what they want and they don't want, and they took actions and had thoughts in favor of what they want, I think the world would be a much better place. But, you know, uh, it's, it's not exactly how it works. No, of course. Yeah. Um, what was what was your journey afterwards? Did you go to university? Yeah, so I uh, graduated from high school and then I went to university in San Antonio, a very small liberal arts school. Uh, I, my degree is business, and this is my life, business major and computer science minor. And so that's that's been my <coughs> business life really my whole life. So when did you join Microsoft after university? So Microsoft was 92. Um, and so I graduated from university in 85. And my mom was really worried about me because I couldn't keep a job. So in about the first three years, I probably worked at about 15 different businesses. Wow. And because I was trying to find my place. Uh, and then I got a job as a programmer 
and then I wrote software, and then I did a, a project for IBM, and then IBM asked me to travel to Redmond, Washington, and I got to meet Bill, and he and I had a very brief conversation about the technology I was writing for IBM. He didn't understand, or he understood, but he didn't know that people were using Windows 3.1 the way I was using it, and so, uh, you know, on it went from there. How long were you at Microsoft for? 92 to 99. I've read on the internet that while you were a manager in Microsoft, mm -hmm. the share price doubled every eight months. Correct. How did you do that? <laughs> I didn't do that. <laughs> How did Microsoft do that? You know, Microsoft was really mad too in 99 because we finished second to Dell as the fastest growing stock in the 1990s. Um, you know, Microsoft just had a huge impact on the world. The Microsoft operating system and what we now call Microsoft Office, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, um, you know, those, yeah, they had a huge impact on the world and they became the de facto standard of a platform for software. Um, and it was a global phenomenon and that powered a lot of the other things that Microsoft also did in business. And, you know, we were just a really valuable company. What would you say your best achievement with Microsoft was? Well, that's pretty easy because uh, it's still in play today. So at Microsoft, I was in charge of all retail clients worldwide. So that meant I had everything from the distribution dock through the supply chain through what you call brick and mortar retail. So brick and mortar retail is everything that's on a high street. Um, it's everything that's in and around a mall. It's everywhere basically where you give them some form of payment and they give you back some form of good. I had worldwide responsibility for that. And in, you know, in a very short span of time, we went from a very small market share in point of sale systems, which is where they take your order and take your cash and, and give it back to you. Um, we went from a very small market share to a very large market share uh, in a very short period of time. And that is the thing that I'm known for. But the fact of the matter is two things. Number one, nobody knows that because who cares the point of sale? It's just something that happens. And then the second thing is, is that, um, you know, there are a thousand people at Microsoft that are the same, yeah. except they did it in some other little segment of the economy. Um, so I don't consider myself special in any way. I just happen to have the right skill set, be at the right place and uh, be willing to do what it took to make it happen for Microsoft. How close were you to Bill Gates? Um, I don't, yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it close. Uh, at Microsoft back then, there were, there were tiers of people and there was this ultimate tier called the FOBs. They were the friends of Bill. And all of us knew who the friends of Bill were and all of us knew who the friends of Bill weren't. And I was not one of the <laughs> friends of Bill. So, um, but you know, I had interactions with Bill at times um, simply because of my responsibilities. And I had some interactions with him, which were always phenomenal. Um, but, you know, it's not like I'm on his Christmas card list or anything. <laughs> what was his um, management style like? Bill's management style is, is really important for me today because Bill believed and still believes um, that the idea is the most important thing. The thought is the most important thing. And it doesn't matter whether Bill had the most, had the best idea or someone around him had the best idea. Now he would challenge you on your ideas ruthlessly uh, to make sure that they were the best ideas. But I, I've always believed that even say here at Leighton Orient and at Lineal and at other places uh, where we've built companies, to me, it's always been who has the best idea. It doesn't matter what their position is or their title or any of that kind of stuff. Who has the best idea? And then let, let's execute on the best ideas. Did you build Iris after you left, straight after you left Microsoft? No, no. There's a seven-year period between, um, between uh, Microsoft and Iris. So after Microsoft, <laughs> I went to work for a company called Vera Center, or w with a company called Vera Center. Um, it's a managed hosting facility uh, company. Today, you would call that where the cloud lives. That's, that's what it is now, but back then, 
Uh, it was a, you know, it's called managed hosting. And so we sold that business in about six and seven, and then we started Iris in seven, and we sold Iris in 15. How much did you sell Iris for? Uh, Iris sold for 134 million. Did you start Iris from scratch? Yes, we did. Okay. We started Iris from scratch. So how did you, how much did you invest in there? Uh, enough. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, just enough. <laughs> Um, how did you scale a business to be ready for exit? Well, so what happened was is that we had a very particular part of the legal technology marketplace that we wanted to work in, and that is called e-discovery, um, electronic discovery. And so we knew kind of what we wanted to do and how we wanted to do it. We had, I had worked in this area a little bit about two years before that for another person, and so we started out the company and we had some clients that we knew. So we went to those clients and we said, this is the thing that we want to do. And then we built up that client base and then we built up the technology. And then, you know, ongoing, it just grew and grew and grew. In fact, the company probably doubled about every 18 months wow. in size. And that's about, that was a little slow, but you know, we did okay. Yeah, and so that, and so we we doubled and doubled and doubled. And then how you get something ready for exit is that we were really smart about how we did contracts with our customers. So we did yearly contracts with our customers. So we had recurring revenue. So when you have recurring revenue, recurring revenue is more valuable than project-based revenue or random revenue. So we had this ongoing contractual flow of money. And that's what made us quite so valuable. So you essentially sold the company due to the future contracts? We took, yeah, we sold the company based on the technology that we had built, what was called man some, a, a strategy called managed services, and the fact that we had recurring revenue in legal technology when most people didn't have recurring re revenue in legal technology. That's, quite, that's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. um, when did you start writing down you want to own a pro sports franchise? <laughs> 20, about 22, 23, 24, 25, somewhere right in there. <laughs> Why did you come to Leighton Orient rather than you've got baseball, you've got <laughs> hockey, you've got American football? Oh my gosh, if you had you, any idea. But you chose to come to East London. Well, I, I looked at the Memphis Grizzlies. Um, I looked at AAA and AA baseball. I looked at Major League Baseball. I looked at uh, Major League Basketball. I looked at, or NBA, NBA National Basketball. Uh, I looked at, I had, got asked to look at a hockey team. I looked at, uh, I got asked to look at NASCAR. I got, I, you know, I got asked to look at a lot of different things. And I really, um, because of the Brazilian team in 2000 and 2002, um, I really love football. Well, I, I, will, I call it football when I'm in the UK. If I'm back in America, I'll call it soccer. So, um, but, you know, I really fell in love with the game, and I got asked to look at some MLS sides, and so I made written offers on uh, the Chicago Fire, I made a written offer on the Philadelphia Union, the Tampa Bay Rowdies. And so I had looked at a lot of different pro sports situations, right? Some of which I could be the minority, my, I'd, I'd end up being a minority owner, and some of them I might end up being a majority owner. And, you know, I had two really good friends because of all this searching for years. I had two really good friends. They called me the same day. I uh, called Nigel Travis the next day. Nigel Travis is the chairman of Leighton Orient Football Club, and he's been a supporter of Leighton for, Leighton for 60 plus years, something like that. Um, had a conversation with Nigel, took about 45 minutes. I said, yeah, let's go. I flew to his house the next day or a couple days after, and that's how I ended up in Leighton. It makes no sense. I don't have any family in London. I don't have any back then. I, don't, I still don't have any family in London. I didn't have any friends in London. I got a ton of friends in London now. I love it. Uh, you know, that our Leighton Orient has, has accepted me as one of the family, which I'm super excited about. Um, I'd never really traveled to London consistently, so it makes no sense for a guy from Texas to, you know, be involved in a club, and especially, you know, in Leighton. In Leighton? Okay, how does that work? But it's been fantastic. 
what would you say your biggest achievement with Leighton Orient is? Getting promoted. <laughs> that's the, I mean, there's nothing, there. that's the pinnacle of success in English football uh, is to move up the pyramid. Unless, you know, you're one of the ones in the Premier League that you don't, you can't get promoted anymore, you, but you go to the Champions League. Um, yeah, getting promoted was that and bringing back a belief that Leighton Orient is a great football club just the way it is. Like it doesn't have to be Americanized. It doesn't have to be, you know, changed in many, many different ways that Americans or other people might say, oh, if you do this, it'll, you know. No, 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 no. Leighton Orient is fine the way it is. It's a traditional family-based club in East London. There's nothing wrong with it. It's fine. It's a great club. And I think maybe just helping bring back some of that belief. Those are probably the two biggest things that I've accomplished. I remember you speaking about the importance of community and the family club. Correct. And when you were speaking to us, that's one thing you mentioned and said, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if this club doesn't become the Manchester United, the Chelsea's, but it has to be a community club because the community are those who've essentially created the club. Correct. Um, why is that? Well, there are a number of very, very valuable community assets in the United Kingdom called football clubs. And if you look across uh, the geography of the country, there are a number of those. They also exist in France and Germany and, and Italy and Spain and Portugal and, and they, are all, they are littered throughout the world. And, and what it is, the reason why it's so important is because it brings people together and it allows them to have a common relationship and a, and a common way of talking about something that they're enjoying together. And so it brings people together. And that, that type of community, that type, you know, where people actually know people. You know, I know the person who sits next to me at the games and, and things like that. I think that's really valuable because it creates that sense of family and it creates that sense of community for a lot of people who may live on their own or are displaced because they, they've, they've had to move for a job or for a relationship or whatever. And so I think for us to be able to supply that sense of community and that sense of family, that's really valuable. How important would you say community is in business? I think that community is massively important in business, but it's a different style of community. I think that the community that you build in business is the community that you build with your employees and you build with your customers and you build with your suppliers. And all businesses have customers, they all have employees, and not all, they might have one employee, but they have employees and they have um, you know, people, people that supply them with things. And so I think you have to build that community, especially with the employees, that they're a part of a team, that they're a part of something bigger than themselves, that they're a part of something that they're trying to accomplish. There's a way that they are contributing something valuable to the world and that they are, in fact, making a difference, not only as a group, but also as an individual. I noticed as we were walking upstairs, you were just saying hello, hi to everyone. You've, it's February 14th on the day we're recording, and he's asked about three people to be their Valentine. <laughs> I don't know if you want this in the cut. That's fine. Um, it's fine. You can see the sense of community you've built within your employees. Sure. Um, when, when they see you, you can see that, okay, they feel happy, and you feel the same way towards them. Sure. But you can feel less genuine. Is that your general management style? Um, you have to make a decision. Um, you either hate people or you love people. Either people are the problem or people are the solution. Uh, in my life and in my world and in my view and in my experience and in my head, um, people are the answer. Uh, people are the joy, people are the solution, and people are great. Uh, I've tried, I, I, you know, I've had, I'm so blessed, uh, I'm so incredibly lucky, you just have no idea. And everywhere I go in the world, there are good people in the world. 
never have I been a place where most of the people were bad, right? Yeah. That most people are good. Most people are good. Most people love family. They love security. They love sort of like just doing their thing, not being, you know, troubled or anything. They don't want any headaches. They just want to live their life. They want to enjoy their life. You know, I've been asked uh, all over the world, you know, do you want to go out to dinner? Do you want to come over to our house? Do you want to, you know, just, just. And so to me, because I so love and I am really intrigued by people, I love the disciplines of sociology and psychology and how they cross over. Um, and I just find it super fascinating. People are fascinating to me. And all this stuff that we do is for people. It's not for the robots. It's not for the aliens or whoever it may be. This is for people. We do what we do, even in the legal technology business, all of those places that I've ever worked, we do things for people. So I just, I just love people. That's true, actually, because you get introverts who don't like people, or they don't interact, like you get the Mark Zuckerberg, right. they don't interact, whereas you get extroverts who put that into their management style, Sir Alex Ferguson, he's known for that, goes to the receptionist, says hello, hi, he remembers their name, gives yeah, them chocolate, sure. and it's them small things that, I would say, inspire and empower your right. team, essentially, to help you grow. Yeah, uh, so I, we have two daughters and, a, and I have a wife, two daughters and a wife, and they're introverts, and <clears throat> they just have a different communication style. I think they still love people. Um, I don't think that being introverted makes it to where you hate people. I think it just means that you enjoy being alone at times more. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. Now, I, I am, I am uh, considered an ambivert have been tested. So ambivert means <clears throat> about 50% of the time, it's actually uh, 44%. 44% of the time, I want to be an introvert. And 56% of the time, I want to be an extrovert. It just so happens that you catch me in my, in my, in my extrovert mode, in my mode or that mood. Um, but yeah, I, I, think, I think all of us, when, you, when it comes down to creation of something great, we all want applause, even if we're introverted. And so I think that an applause only comes from people. I guess you can, you know, put technology on it and make it clap for you but yeah but but you see what I'm saying is, is that most of us want to be known most of us want approval most of us want love most of us want that and we're going to get that primarily from people okay excellent yeah um did you want to say that you'd lose all your money but it's going to be a fun ride all along them lines when you're investing in Leighton Orient correct I've already lost some of it so it's all good <laughs> <laughs> was, was this I know you've written it down in your goals but was did you look at any aspect of a, a business model or was it just yes straight into oh completely no 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 there, there's there is clearly a specific business model here uh, the amount that we spend on wages for the players is a specific style of business model that is different from a number of different clubs both in league two and all around the world, um, slightly different. Um, no, the reason that I said, what I wanted to make sure that everybody understood, I'm not the guy who wants to own a pro sports franchise called Leighton Orient in the National League so that we get promoted to League One, to League Two, then League One, then Championship, then Premier League, and I'm only going to feel like we're successful if we go through all of those steps. What I wanted to make sure that everyone understood was that for me personally, it was not about making money. This was about making a contribution, making a difference, and absolutely having the best time of my life. And I hopefully I've, I have had the best time of my life. Now, I know my wife she disagrees with me at times, but you know, my daughters do too, but that's okay. Um, but it, yeah, it, it, I just wanted everybody to know it wasn't about the money. Yeah, Henry Winter is actually who asked me that question. Ah, uh, in the Times. Yeah, correct. What would you say your best achievement in business is? And how did you do it? 
Well, I know how I did them all. Uh, work. Just persistence. There was just no... I was unwilling to accept that it couldn't be accomplished. It was more a question of how it was going to be accomplished than and when it was going to be accomplished than if it was going to be accomplished. And, you know, my mom and dad, again, so lucky to be in the family I'm in, they taught me work ethic, they taught me, they taught me character, they taught me patience, they taught me persistence. Um, you know, they taught me all of those things. My sisters taught me how to talk to people and, you know, and interact and do all that. And, and so, um, but to name one specific thing that I've accomplished, um, it's hard because I've had so many sort of like brilliant moments in my life, um, where I'm super proud of maybe something that people would say, what are you talking about? That's not, that's not that big of a deal. You know, there are, there are times in business when I have convinced people that they could do more than they could do, be more than they thought they could be, and they became greater than maybe they thought they could have become. How did you and those that? are some of the greatest achievements is my... my influence or ability to help people be more than they thought. And the way that you do that is you encourage, you give clear and valuable feedback, you allow them to set their own objectives and then say maybe they can do more. You support them, you, you consistently remind them of certain things um, and, you know, there are lots of different ways that you help people become more than they thought they could become. And that's, that's a really important thing to do as a, as a business person, as a parent, as a family member, as a member of a community. These things seem very simple to do. Correct. But why is it so difficult? Um... I, I, I want to say selfishness is what I want to say. I'm not sure I want to be quoted for that, but um, I, think that, I think that sometimes we get confused about the percentage of give and take that we should be involved in in this world. I have a firm belief that if I can just barely tip the scales in my favor, thus I give 51% of the time and take 49% of the time, karma is always on my side. That's kind of how I look at it. And I know that's very simple, but the other thing that I've tried to do is I've tried to develop the habit. I remember a time when I would, someone would look at me and I would look away from them immediately. I remember training myself, this is so simple, I remember training myself to hold their gaze and smile. Just hold their gaze and smile. Have you tried that on the tube? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I love it. Oh, it's one of my favorite things. That's one of my favorite things to do to people. It freaks them out. Yeah. But they smile. They smile back, but then they look away as quick as they possibly can. And I've done it. I walk down the street in New York and London, and I say hi to people that I don't know. It freaks them out. It's a great, this, that's that sociology thing that yeah. I love. So, you know, little things like that, paying people a compliment, saying hello, the things, you know, that's, those are habits that I tried to develop in order to make it to where it was easier for me to make a contribution. What keeps you motivated? What keeps you, what makes you jump out of bed every morning to continue doing what you're doing? Well, because you could easily retire on, on a beach. I've tried somewhere. it. I've tried it. I retired in 99. Um, I was, let's see, in 99, I would have been 36. Um, I tried it. It was terrible. Uh, it was awful. I hated it. Uh, I never want to be retired. Um, Why? I, I, am, I am mentally built to contribute. So if I'm going to give 51% of the time, 
mentally I'm built to contribute 51% of the time. I got to contribute. I need to contribute. I need to make a difference. I need to figure out another way to make a difference, another area to make a difference in. And so what gets me out of the, you know, out of bed in the morning is I have a schedule <laughs> and I've made commitments. That's one thing. But then the other thing is, is that I'm just trying to figure out ways to make more of a contribution and, and have a bigger impact on the people that I love or the people that I'm, I'm interested in. During your early days in business, was it motivation or was it discipline that pushed you? Because I, I feel you need, you need discipline. I think it's both, yeah. But sometimes you're not motivated to do Correct. something. Correct. Oh, For example, yeah. you might be, oh, I'm not motivated to sit no, here, no, no. but your schedule makes you disciplined. No. no, no, no. Sometimes I get motivated when I get up and I have a cup of coffee. Now I'm motivated, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? So, yeah, I don't wake up every morning like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to change the world today. This is going to be the greatest thing ever. Eh? You know, it just doesn't work like that. Um, but yeah, for me, you have to have motivation and you have to have discipline and you have to, you have to learn and you have to be a little bit smarter. You know, there are things that, there are things that I accomplish today that take me three minutes when it used to take me six, eight, 10, 15 minutes. And so I get some things done faster. Also today, I have more friends around the world than I've ever had in my life. And so I can say to a friend of mine, let me connect you to another friend of mine. Y'all just do the do, the do whatever y'all want to do. Y'all work it out and they can contribute to each other. And so there are just, I just have now points of leverage that I didn't have when I was younger too. But as far as why I get up in the morning, well, I breathe, that's one reason. But then the second reason is, is that I believe that the world is a great place to be and you know I, I really want to make a difference. I just want to try to help as best I can. What's one thing you've probably done that has helped the world? Or your proudest thing that you've helped the world? Had kids. Like I know that's a really strange like yeah you had a kid, you had three girls, so what? Um, but you know having children, raising children, being involved in their lives and helping them grow, um, you know, that, that's a great thing. Uh, you know, my relationship with my wife, 30 years of marriage, um, you know, that, that's another just amazing, like ongoing thing, you know. Um, and I think at Leighton Orient, I've made a difference. Lineal, I've made a difference. Iris, I made a difference. Microsoft, I made a difference. Vera Center, you know, Saber Software and IBM and all that. You know, I made a difference. But I think those are, you know, it's the memories that you make and it's the people that you enjoy those memories with. Because there are still people in this world that I'll have a conversation with and they'll say, you remember when we did this 25 years ago? And I'm like, oh, yeah, it was great. Yeah. What would you say your most difficult moment in business was? Oh, there have been times when uh, the company was going to go bankrupt or, you know, we had a really hard time in 08 and 09 getting money to, you know, checking accounts just weren't even flowing. Uh, you know, I've, I've had really difficult times where employees have been extremely upset about something that I thought was very different from what they thought. Um, you know, there's been financial troubles in business. There's been people troubles in business. There's been customers that are telling us they need all their money back plus more. Um, you know, there have been very, very dark times personally for me, professionally for me. Um, Family-wise, I haven't really had hardly anything like that, so I've been very lucky in that regard. But, you know, everybody goes through trouble and strife and trials. That's, that's, right. you have to overcome. That's, it's set up to where you overcome. That's what accomplishment means, to overcome. Yeah. So how do you overcome these setbacks? Some days I lay down and take a nap. <laughs> you know, some days I get up and get to work. Some days I fly somewhere and have a face-to-face -face conversation. Um, you know, I just do whatever I think will be the most expedient and best way to overcome whatever that particular challenge is. Would you say there's no specific thing that you do? I think the thing that I do is I try, I'm, I'm sure I'm not always really great at it, but I try to see it from the other person's point of view. 
and understand what benefits they're trying to obtain from whatever we're going to accomplish together. And that, I think that's the, you know, that's probably the main like idea or underlying principle there. Okay. What, what advice would you give to aspiring business people? Never yeah. give up. S Just never that. give up. There, there's probably three. One is do what you love. Now, this is a hard one because most people do for money. They don't do for love. <clears throat> so part of that is knowledge of what are you good at? What are your natural talents? What are your natural inclinations? Some people are inclinated toward engineering. Some people are art. Some people are science. Some people are math. Some people are money. Some people are... And so you have to figure out what your natural inclination is. That's number one. Number two is make it to where you're doing it for them, not just for you. You have to make it to where the business is built for other people. It's built for your customers. It's built to deliver some kind of value for your customers. And then the third thing is persistence. You just can't ever give up. Yeah, yeah, that, that company may go under. That, may, that company, that sale might not work. That situation may not be the best, whatever. But you just can never give up on the idea that you have natural talent, you are trying to do what you best can do for the world, and you're just going to keep doing it because eventually you'll win. And eventually you do win. But how does a person stay persistent? Because sometimes it could be sale after sale after sale, which isn't going through. Correct. And they might feel like, you know what, I need to give up. But how do they stay persistent, especially if they're doing what they love and they have the talent for it? Let me, let me, let me, let me say it this way from my own personal experience. <clears throat> I decided when I was about 17 years old, I wanted money. Lot, 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 not like a little bit of money, like a lot of money. Like I wanted a lot of money. <clears throat> and I went to work. And work 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 and work. And guess what? All that money still hadn't showed up. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, I've made a lot of money. I admit it. I've made a lot of money. But the way you stay the way you stay persistent is you basically say, I am unwilling to accept the reality that X is not true yet. Does this go back down to writing your goal? Yeah, well, and then that helps. It? Yeah, that helps. That helps. Because you're clear on what you want. But yeah, I mean, you, you just keep, you just have to keep at it. Because that's just how it works. Why, does a, why is a positive mindset important? I think only a, <clears throat> I think a positive mindset is only important because it allows you to interact and interact with the world and interact with people from the idea that things are going to happen as opposed to from the idea or perception that things are not going to happen. So I think you're going to end up just being, if you want to be happy at all, then I think that you should have somewhat of a, I'm not saying happy clappy, which is the words they use around here, but I think that you should have a positive mindset toward, I can do this, I probably can make this happen, it's going to be fun when it happens, you know, that sort of thing, as opposed to, it's probably never going to happen, it's a disaster, when it happens, I'm going to hate it, well, you, you know, you can, you can sort of choose how you think about things, and it can make a big difference in the way that you feel and the way that you act. I think it's about tricking your brain, or as you said, brainwashing yeah, 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 yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because from I can do it to I can't do it, it's like the fridge earlier. We right. didn't notice the noise until someone <laughs> right. pointed it out. Exactly. Yeah, and, and I, think that, I think that if you, you – I don't believe that in – I don't believe in, like, rote memory mantras where you just tell yourself – over and over and over. I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy. That doesn't work because your mind says, you're an idiot. You're an idiot. You're an idiot. I'm happy. I'm happy. You're an idiot. You know, you have to make it to where the things that you say to yourself in the initial parts of the brainwashing, you have to tell yourself things initially that are mostly true. I don't really deal in absolutes. Like, I'm not absolutely going to be worth this amount of money at this time. I'm just saying that I have the ability or I have the desire to have this much money at this particular time. Because once you get into real hard line absolutes on either side, your mind will tell you that's not the reality. Like, I'm going to be happy all the time. 
No, you're not. That's just ridiculous. And so you, can, you just can't look at it like that. So you have to say, oh, I'm happy the majority of the time, most of the time, when appropriate. You know, there's all kinds of ways to say it. And generally, you'll be more happy. What's the, what's the future for Kent Teague? Well, we're in the fourth quarter. Because <laughs> I've been on this planet a couple years, and, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a termination clause out here somewhere. Um, you know, I really, I hope that, um, you know, I just figure out ways to make a difference uh, in ways that people didn't expect and, you know, that people really value. Um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm 60, and so that changed, you know, the numbers changed. You know, mentally I'm about 28, probably, something like that. And on a match day? Yeah, and on a match day I'm, I'm, I'm worse than that. I'm a kid in a candy store. Uh, but it's, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't really know. I mean, lineal, we're going to do the lineal thing, the legal technology business that we, that we bought in, uh, in London and we've expanded globally. Um, I'll do that. I'll probably tend more towards some more philanthropic type ideas and concepts and things like that, go change the world in ways uh, maybe in our local community and that sort of thing. Um, but who knows? Who knows what the future is? Who knows? I may wake up one day and write something down and y'all all be like, he's lost his mind and then that's what I'm going to go do. <laughs> um, we have a bit of a quick fire round. Yeah, go. Um, favorite English food? Uh, fish and chips. That's an English food. Uh, you know, there's a lot of food in England, but, you know, fish and chips. Um, American food or English food, what do you prefer? Uh, American, well, American food's not really American food. American food's from everywhere else in the world for the most part. But, yeah, no, um, <clears throat> I have an addiction. It's called hamburger, french fries, and a Dr. Pepper. <laughs> I love Cajun food, but that's more French. Um, yeah, but yeah, I love steak and, you know, seafood and stuff like that. So favorite food probably has to be American over English. No offense, please. <laughs> um, favorite holiday destination? Because you've traveled a lot. There is no, all of those are places I haven't been. So this summer we're going on a food and wine tour in France. I haven't been to Egypt. I haven't seen the pyramids. I haven't been to... I haven't, I haven't been to Dubai. I haven't been to, I mean, there are so many places in this world I haven't been. Uh, China, uh, Beijing, and Shanghai, and Xi'an, unbelievable. Tokyo, and, you know, Japan, unbelievable. Kenya, incredible. Machu Picchu in Peru, unbelievable. Uh, love New York. You know, I love Atlanta, love Miami, love Miami too much. Um, it, I, I don't sleep very well in Miami for some reason. Um, you know, there are so many places in the world that I've been, uh, and Australia is phenomenal. To get the chance to swim, you know, in Australia at the Great Barrier Reef, I mean, what are you going to do? So, uh, so one. many. Oh, impossible, my friend. It's not. <clears throat> Uh, it's impossible to say because there's nothing like the Vatican and yet there's nothing like Kenya and there's nothing like the terracotta warriors and there are just so many impressive incredible I have been in Westminster and just broke into tears in Westminster here in London um, because of the the historical significance of where I found myself uh, in Westminster. Uh, so, yeah, there's no, there's no favorite place. There's no specific, like I always want to go back there. Not Texas. I always want to go home. <laughs> oh, I always want to go home. That's not fair. I thought we were going on <laughs> no, vacation, <laughs> but, yeah, just, uh, I but that yeah. Me. Oh, I love Texas. Yeah, no doubt. Um, favorite, favorite football player? Okay, so Ronaldo, but not the seven, the nine. The original one. The original one, only because of my love of Brazilian soccer in that time period. Ronaldo, Ronaldinho, Roberto Carlos, there are a number of the players then. 
Messi is an unbelievable talent. Ronaldo, seven, CR7, unbelievable talent. Um, you know, Pele, and I mean, there are some where they're just, they are just slightly a cut above of all the rest. Um, but yeah, that, you know, you didn't, you asked me English football player, I know. So that's, <laughs> no, no, just worldwide. <laughs> no, no, worldwide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I, I meant not American football player, yeah. like, you know, some of that. But anyway, um, go ahead. Favorite day of the week? I don't, I don't have a favorite day of the week. And the reason is, is that, I'll just admit this out loud again, I, my life is so integrated between family, friends, work, pleasure, travel, all of these things, food, enjoyment, work, all that, uh, that there is no favorite day of the week. I work on Sunday, I check emails on Sunday, I do, you know, WhatsApp and things, I'm interacting with people every day of the week, Saturday, Sunday, Saturday, late in Orient, Tuesday nights, whatever. Um, you know, it's all work, but it's all fun. Yeah. So for me, there is no favorite day of the week. Thank you very much, Ken. It Always was, uh, a pleasure. Good a seeing pleasure. you again. You as well. Yeah. Thank you very Cheers. Much.